Well, so starting with Dr. Poveda, he is a professor in the Department of, Department of Geosciences and Environment of the National University of Colombia in Medellin. He is a civil engineer from the National University of Colombia, has a master's degree in water resources development from the National University of Colombia in Medellin. He's a, he has a master's in engineering sciences from the University of California, Davis. He has a PhD in water resources from the University, National University of Columbia. He has, has had postdoctoral experience in hydroecology at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Has been visiting professor at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. The Center for Hydrology and Ecology in Wellingford, United Kingdom and the Max Planck Institute of Biogeochemistry in Jena, in Germany. He is a winner of the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize in 2007 as a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He is a full member of the Colombian Academy of Exact Physical and Natural Sciences and of the World Academy of Sciences. In 2019, he was a part of the International Mission of Experts experts convened by the Colombian government. He is currently a member of the scientific panel for the Amazon. He is also a member of the International Scientific Steering Committee of the Global Water and Energy Cycles Research Program and a member of the scientific team of the NASA Global Participation Measurement Mission. He is author and co-author of 15 books, more than 300 articles published in national and international journals, and more than 300 presentations at national and international meetings on hydro hydrology, meteorology, oceanography, hydroclimatology, water resources, advanced mathematics, climate change and climate variability, and their social, environmental, and econo economic impacts, including agriculture, water supply, power generation, natural disasters, and transmission of tropical diseases. First of all, I would like to thank the Enrique and the organizers for inviting me to, to participate in this very relevant panel. So I'll start by sharing my screen, I believe. Okay, so I'm going to talk about impacts of climate change and land use change in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, let's start by saying that uh, the conclusions of the fifth and sixth reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, are, are the following. The warming in the climate system is unequivocal. And since the 50s, most observed changes are unprecedented in the last decades to millennia. Second, that the human influence on the climate system is clear. And third, that limiting climate change will require substantial and sustained reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, the, the important uh, thing here is that temperatures worldwide are rising rapidly. Here we, we can see an animation from the last 200 years or 150 years from 1880 to 2022. Uh, blue colors are colder than the three decades from 51 to 1980 and red colors warmer than those three decades. As we can see in the recent years, we have been experiencing warmings, very rapid warming, especially in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Arctic size, uh, Ocean. So this is causing a lot of environmental, societal, economical, and all kinds of crises uh, with, with very important consequences worldwide and especially for the developing countries like in Latin America. Here we see, we can see that the causes of the climate change, uh, yeah, is uh, of course associated with the emission of greenhouse gases, especially CO2 and methane to the atmosphere. And in second term by deforestation. So 80% of the greenhouse gases emissions are due to to the release of, of uh, greenhouse gases by industry, by transport, by energy system, but also 20% of, of CO2 emissions to the atmosphere is due to deforestation, which is a problem that touches very, very uh, uh, 
closely in 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 South America. So we're gonna we're gonna discuss the the two issues here because there are uh, these two issues are imposing tremendous challenges for Latin America and for the global South, especially. Not, not only carbon dioxide, but methane, of course, is increasing because of, of or due to the, the emission of greenhouse gases by agriculture, by cattle ranching, and all of, well, many other processes. These are some of the observed impacts of climate change and land use change in Latin America, evidenced in, since the fifth assessment report of the IPCC in 2014. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go into the details of this transparency, but it's enough to say that every one of these uh, uh, arrows are indicating if temperature, rainfall, river discharges, land use, and, and vector diseases are increasing or decreasing uh, associated with climate change. These are not expected outcomes. These are already observed impacts of climate change in the region. So as you can see, all over the place in Latin America, we are feeling strong impacts of, of all those in all those sectors and, and systems associated with climate change, with very important economical and societal implications and, and impacts. One of the main uh, evidences is the intensification of stronger hurricanes in the North Atlantic and the Caribbean Sea in the recent years, a prediction that has become reality due to climate change, because it's very easy to show that in a warmer climate and a warmer ocean, of course, the development or the, the formation of, of uh, hurricanes and cyclones in the tropical oceans is increasing and, 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 and of course we are feeling the consequences of all those uh, uh, hurricanes in our region, especially in the Caribbean, in Central America and in other South America. Uh, the projected changes of course are dependent on the different uh, scenarios, future scenarios of climate change depending on 1.5 two degrees or four degrees, and in different variables like maximum temperature, total precipitation, maximum five-day precipitation, and consecutive dry days. All over the place, the impacts and the consequences are going to be huge and very important for the region in the next uh, decades and in, until the, the end of this 21st century. The observed impacts of climate change on ecosystems are also very important in our region because in, in, in Central and South America, in small islands uh, as in the Caribbean, but also in tropical forests, in mountain regions, and in, in very important biodiversity hotspots, Latin America houses the one, one of the most important biodiversity hotspots uh, in, in, on Earth. And the expected impacts and the observed impacts of climate change on those ecosystems in their structure, in the species range shifts and change in timing and phenology of, of different ecosystems are affecting very, very strongly all over the place in Latin America and the Caribbean. So this 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 is a this is a very important issue because uh, the Latin America is perhaps one of the most biodiversity, the, the, one of the regions with the most uh, extraordinary biodiversity on Earth. So if climate change is affecting these ecosystems, of course, the, the biodiversity of our continent is in peril. Uh, and of course, this is not going this is not this is going to impact not only the sustainable development of the region but also the economic development of the region because of the, the importance of bioeconomics for the economic for the future of the region so this is a very very important issue for our continent of course one question is is that if we are uh, experiencing or witnessing more El Niño and La Niña events, because also El Niño and La Niña are parts of climate variability, natural climate variability, 
But of course, climate change is increasing and is affecting their intensity and frequency, as we can see in these public recent publications associated with forecasted and observed uh, more frequent occur occurrences of El Nino and La Nina with all the strong impacts that those events have in Latin America. Of course, the, there is the, this problem of climate inequality because we, we know that uh, the, the, the global north, uh, to say so, is responsible for causing this problem worldwide. But, uh, but the global south is, is uh, the region of the world who will who, who bear, the, the, bear the burden of health-related deaths, disease, and food security by 2025. So here we can see the geopolitical uh, implications of climate change and the, and the climate inequality that is causing worldwide and especially affecting the global south. So the solution of the problem mainly has to come from the global north. Of course, in the global south, we, we also have responsibilities to, associated with, especially with deforestation, but I, I will touch upon uh, that issue a little bit later. Uh, for instance, here we can see the, the incidence of malaria in Colombia from 1960 to two years ago. We can see that there is an increasing trend that we cannot disprove that climate change is the culprit. But also we see that every time we have El Nino events, we have outbreaks of malaria in Colombia. So especially these vector-borne diseases uh, are going to be increased with climate change, but also with El Nino more frequent, we're going to have more intense and more frequent malaria outbreaks in Colombia in the near future. Of course, as I said, deforestation is a tremendous problem for our region. Here we can see deforestation in the last 20 years from the Global Forest Watch. The red dots are regions who have been deforested through the, during the last 20 years. As you can see here is a tr tremendous amount of land who, who has been converted into pastures and cattle ranching uh, lands with all kinds of uh, implication in terms of hydrological impacts, climatological impact, and, and uh, biogeochemical impacts throughout the continent. In Colombia, it, Colombia, it, and, and this is not happening on the, not only in the, in the Brazilian uh, Amazon, but also in all the countries that share the Amazon river basin with Brazil. These are pictures from the, um, Colombian Amazon, and we are seeing here that the same type of processes are going on in Colombia. The destruction of the Amazon rainforest is, is also um, very, very uh, worrisome because of the hydrological, climatological, and ecological implications of, of and the impacts of deforestation on the hydrological cycle of South America. And here I can show, I, I want to show you this is a very nice video because it is showing is this is the result of a very sophisticated climatic model uh, and here we are going to see the de hourly dynamics of the production of uh, of water vapor and the transport of water vapor by the winds in tropical south america and we we're going to see the diurnal beating of, a, of the diurnal cycle associated with photosynthesis and evapotranspiration that emits water vapor to the atmosphere during the day and closes the processes during the night. We are going to see here from December 2004 to March 2005, and as we can see here, all the all the transport of moisture starts at the tropical uh, Atlantic Ocean, and then it goes to the continent. Sometimes uh, evapotranspirating and rain and raining all over the Amazon basin before this water vapor is transported to the Andes, and then uh, from the western Andes all the way until the La Plata River basin, reaching southeastern South America in places like Buenos Aires and Montevideo. So the the whole transport of water vapor in Latin America is controlled by the Amazon rainforest. So if we if we deforest the Amazon rainforest, we are putting in peril all water resources in, in South America 
because cities like Bogota, Quito and La Paz gets their water for all type of, of uh, consumes and, and usages from the, the evapotranspiration of water in the low lying Amazon River basin. So we need to, we need to preserve the Amazon rainforest because uh, this uh, the ecosystem is subject to a strong rates of deforestation, putting in peril all the water supply for uh, in, entire or very large portions of, of South America. And of course, the Amazon as a, a one of the tipping points of the, of the climatic systems is also subject or is under peril to suffer uh, a so-called tipping point because uh, scientific research has shown that we don't have to, to cut the entire Amazon forest to produce a collapse of the, of the forest. Just a 25% deforestation of the Amazon River uh, forest could collapse the tropical rainforest leading to a warmer and, and drier ecosystem, something like a savanna. So the, the entire water cycle of, of, of South America depends on the Amazon River Basin, but also many other regions of the world associated with the climatic teleconnection, teleconnections are connected to the Amazon River Basin. So we need to protect, we need to cut deforestation, we need to stop deforestation of, the, of this tropical rainforest for the sustainable development, not only of Latin America, but also of the world. And last word is something that he, it has been discovered very recently by two Russian scientists, Makarieva and Gorskov, they discovered this wonderful mechanism called the biotic pump of atmospheric moisture, whereby the, the, the evapotranspiration of forest causes the condensation of water in the atmosphere and condensation leads to a, a atmospheric pressure gradient between the ocean and the, and the continents. So by the evapotranspiration of forest and the condensation of water vapor into clouds, the forests are soaking in moisture or winds from the ocean to the continents, maintain, maintaining the, the, the continents with extraordinary amounts of rainfall like in, in South America. So if we cut the forest, we're going to collapse this wonderful mechanism. And this is another reason why we need to preserve the, the tropical rainforest of South America. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Dr. Juan Fernando Salazar Villegas was very, very shy in sending a very short CV. Uh, I know he has done many, many, many more things. He's, this is just a summary. Uh, Dr. Salazar is a professor at the University of Antioquia. Uh, he has a doctor in water resources. He's a researcher on hydro uh, hydrology and climate issues with implications for sustainability. Author of scientific and general dissemination publications on water security including water availability and flood, flood, flood risk, climate change, consequences of deforestation, climate tipping points, moisture recycling, and watershed management, among others. He is a member of the Colombian Young Academy, which is associated with the Colombian Academy of, Natural, of Exact Physical and Natural Sciences. Hello, everybody. I, I'm very happy and very honored to be here, especially talking uh, after Herman, who's my mentor. So you will note that during my presentation, because I, I will say some things he, he already mentioned, and, and my focus will be to talk about the, the what I will call the South American water cycles heart. So we have heard many times that the, the Amazon forest is like the lung of the planet or like, like the lungs of the planet. And, and that's a fine analogy be, because of the role of the forest in, in the global carbon cycle. But that's just a part of the story because uh, as you saw in, in Herman's presentation, the, the Amazon forest is also a, a some something that we can describe as a beating heart for the water cycle in South America. Uh, and this is because of the uh, because this forest plays a major 
role in distributing water throughout the continent. And this role or this distribution of water throughout the continent is threatened by deforestation. So these are the two ideas I, I will emphasize during the rest of my presentation. What, I, what I'm gonna do is to show some examples about what I'm saying. Uh, first, we know that we have the South American low level jet, which you can see in this very nice drawing uh, with the green arrow. Uh, maybe you already know this, but maybe some of you don't. So in a nutshell, this South American low level jet is, is like a big atmospheric river. It's like a really big flow of water, uh, transporting water uh, from the ocean through the continent. Uh, uh, and it is very important for feeding precipitation in different parts of the continent, especially in the La Plata River Basin, but not only there, because there's seasonal variability. So uh, in some months of the year, this same pattern transports a very important amounts of water to Northwestern South America, including my home country, Colombia. And uh, this uh, role of the Amazon in distributing water throughout the continent uh, results from many phenomena, uh, I would say complex phenomena, including moisture recycling, which is very important in this, in this story. Uh, we talk about moisture recycling when uh, precipitation uh, over a region is fed by evapotranspiration originating in the same region. Uh, and this is very important in the Amazon forest. So for instance, the Amazon river basin um, produces around 30% of the precipitation falling over the same basin. And this is uh, mainly because the capacity of the Amazon forest to, to produce a very uh, intense flows of evapotranspiration, uh, which is the transport of water from the surface to the atmosphere. So we have moisture going from the surface to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration and feeding precipitation elsewhere. And this combined with the winds flowing from the Atlantic Ocean to the Andes produces something that we could describe as a conveyor belt of moisture uh, that you can see here in the top of the figure. So this is like a conveyor belt that transport water because we have this recycling process. But if we somehow disrupt this recycling process, we could disrupt the conveyor belt and we could affect the distribution of the water throughout the continent. And the best way to disrupt this recycling is by, by deforesting the forest. So, so that's a way deforestation is threatening the, the role of the forest in distributing water in our continent. And we know that deforestation is advancing very, very rapidly in South America. This is also from the Global Forest Watch. And you can see the accumulated tree cover loss during the last two decades. So what I'm saying is that this deforestation could cause a heart attack in the continent water cycle. And one important thing here is that we are sure that deforestation will change or is already changing the continent's water cycle, in, including precipitation. And, and I say that we are sure because despite the differences among the studies, and here you can see like just a, a random sample of studies studying these deforestation effects on the water cycle and mainly on precipitation. So, so despite the differences among the studies, all of them have in common that, that the idea that, the, that massive deforestation of the Amazon forest will significantly change uh, precipitation in the continent. So 
there's no room for doubt about it, I, I think. And how does it look like a, a heart attack or, or how big could be a change? This is, this is an example uh, from a study estimating how much uh, precipitation falling in different parts of the continent comes from the Amazon forest. So what you see here is the fraction of precipitation originating in the Amazon forest. For instance, in, in my home country in Colombia, we have a basin, uh, uh, the, the Magdalena River Basin that is very important for our water and energy and food security. And these estimates indicate that, uh, sorry, that around 20 or 30% of precipitation falling over the Magdalena River Basin comes from the Amazon uh, forest or, or from the Amazon basin and is threatened by deforestation. This is from a paper we published in 2019. Uh, we studied here uh, uh, how precipitation changes with distance to the ocean along with the streamlines uh, flowing over the forest or beyond it. Uh, you can see two streamlines here, but we did it with many streamlines. What we found is that precipitation grows exponentially over the forest, exponentially with distance to the ocean, but only over the forest. Uh, and this can occur over very long distances, like in the bottom of the of the slide. This is a this is around 3,000 kilometers, and you can see like uh, exponential growth of precipitation over such a long distance, meaning that precipitation grows from a relatively small value here to a very high value here. And very importantly, this pattern, or, or we did not find this pattern uh, over other land covers. And most importantly, we find that this pattern can reverse, uh, meaning that we can uh, pass from an uh, exponential growth of precipitation to an exponential decline of precipitation after the forest. So uh, we are afraid that deforestation could produce changes like transforming an exponential growth of precipitation into an exponential decline of precipitation, meaning huge impacts on, on water availability in different parts of the continent. And if we have effects of deforestation on precipitation, we will have effects on the whole water cycle, including river discharge, which is very, very important for different things in our societies and ecosystems. This is uh, from a meta-analysis we published last year. It is about studies investigating the deforestation effects on river discharge in large basins of South America. And what we found is that if the studies consider deforestation effects on precipitation, then the a consequence of deforestation in these big river basins will be a very important reduction in river discharge in most cases that you can see here. And another important message here is that this deforestation causing river discharge reduction is not only occurring within the same basins, but also outside the basins, mainly in the Amazon. So what I'm saying here is that deforestation in the Amazon can cause very important reductions of river discharge uh, in other basins like the La Plata Basin in the southern part of the continent or the Magdalena and Orinoco Basin in the northern part. And uh, another message that I want to highlight here is that we miss this if we use the most typical approach of using hydrological models to simulate deforestation uh, scenarios within a basin and without considering the deforestation effects on precipitation, if we neglect these effects, we would 
obtain the result uh, that you can see here in the red and blue box plot, which, uh, which represent river discharge increases. But we think that this is a, a misleading result, and this is in part because of neglecting deforestation impacts on precipitation that we know are real effects. So the, there will be consequences also on river discharge that can be really important for the continent. And there are many more examples, but for the sake of brevity, I, I want just to conclude by saying that protecting the Amazon forest is in the best interest of our societies. Uh, if we lose this forest, our water cycle in South America will suffer something that I would describe as a heart attack, meaning that we won't keep the rainfall and river discharge regimes that we are used to have, and more importantly, that we have planned for. Our plans will not work if we lose this forest. Uh, thank you. And the next, the next speaker is Dr. Graciela Diaz de Delgado. She is from Venezuela, from Maracaibo. She studied chemistry at the Universidad de los Andes in Merida, Venezuela, and obtained her PhD in chemistry at Brandeis University in Massachusetts. In 1989, she joined the crystallography laboratory at the University of Los Andes as assistant professor and has been a full professor since 2002. Among other, among other roles, she has been chair of the crystallography laboratory, chair of the interdisciplinary graduate program in applied chemistry, and director of graduate studies at the Faculty of Sciences. She has supervised numerous bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees, degree thesis. She has more than 70 publications in peer reviewed and indexed journals and more than 300 presentations in national, national and international congresses uh, and as invited speaker at prestigious universities around the world. She is a member of the American Crystallographic Association, the International Center for Diffraction Data, the American Chemical Society, is a founding member of the Venezuelan Society of Crystallography and of the Latin American Crystallographic Association. In these organizations, she has participated in many science outreach activities. She was a member of the Committee for the Celebration at the University of Los Andes of the International Year of Chemistry in 2011 and of the American Crystallographic Association Committee for the Celebration of the International Year of Crystallography in 2014. Currently, she serves on the Executive Committee of the International Union of Crystallography, the Board of Directors of ICDD, and is one of the four section editors of Acta Crystallographica E. Since June 2022, she is a member of the Liaison Committee of the IEC Regional focal point for Latin America and the Caribbean. Her research interests include the structural characterization by single crystal and powder diffraction techniques of active pharmaceutical ingredients, precursors and intermediates in the synthesis of pharmaceuticals, commercial pharmaceutical products, as well as natural products isolated from medicinal plants in the Venezuelan Andes. Of particular interest is the study of polymorphism in these compounds, solid state reactions induced by radiation, heat pressure, and other agents during synthesis, processing, storage, and or transport of pharmaceuticals. She is also interested in analytical techniques applied to cultural heritage items, symmetry in art, and science outreach. So, Graciela. It's your turn, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Enrique, for the invitation. And uh, thank you, and I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, 
uh, be a part of this panel of distinguished scientists uh, and to try to present uh, a little bit of the perspective that we have from the crystallography uh, area uh, and how we can approach and uh, try to contribute to reaching the, the goals that uh, have been set for uh, uh, 2030 uh, with regard to food, uh, water, uh, access, uh, and in general, sustainable uh, development. Well, I'm going to, to try to um, uh, present some of the work that we can, uh, that, that we have been doing uh, over the years and uh, that uh, we can uh, do by using, uh, in particular, a crystallographic techniques, diffraction, X-ray diffraction on uh, powder samples and uh, on single crystals. And, uh, but this uh, applied to um, assuring the quality and the safety of food and pharmaceutical ingredients uh, as um, additional techniques which uh, provide a, a very uh, complete um, a view of, uh, uh, of these very important uh, materials in, in our day, everyday life. So as uh, Enrique said, as uh, I am a member of the crystallography laboratory at uh, Facultad de Ciencias in Universidad de los Andes in Merida, Venezuela, and uh, my, my perspective will be a little bit uh, 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 more inclined to, towards uh, that uh, area of research. See, um, within the, the 17 uh, sustainable development goals that have been uh, set for 2030, uh, certainly uh, building and increasing capacities in the characterization of materials is, uh, of, utmost, is of utmost uh, importance to secure the access to uh, medicines and uh, uh, food and clean water and other, uh, many other uh, basic needs that uh, our population has, in particular in Latin America and the Caribbean region. Uh, it is uh, well- Graciela, the slides yes. are not changing. They, they're not changing. We, we're the first, we have the first one only. Oh, okay, okay. The title. Yes, I don't know why the, the screen got so uh, so small. I'm going to start it again because uh, I'm I'm sorry. We ch we checked this and uh, we checked oh. this and I don't know what happens. Uh, let's see. Should go out and in again. Okay. Okay. I think we will be able to see it better now. I hope. <laughs> okay, there, there it is, but probably if you put it in full screen. Yes. I don't know what happened. Uh, we just, uh, we just check it out. That's just strange. Uh, yes, uh, let me, let me get out of here. Yes, I think. Okay. Okay, I think. Can you, can you put it's it just that for the screen. Yes. Uh... Yes. You click down there, right there. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Do you see it now in presenting mode only? Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. That's, that's fine. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Something fine. happened when I was trying that. There. Okay, so um, in Latin America, there are, are certainly uh, many efforts that are made to, to allow the population to uh, secure access to, um, let me see, I think this is not, uh, I, okay, I think, yeah, it's better now. <laughs> Okay, I think it's better now. <laughs> uh, so as I was saying, there are uh, many efforts to um, secure uh, low cost drugs and uh, other uh, type of products for the treatment of uh, different diseases. And this is uh, using generic drugs. Uh, this is facilitated by, by the patent expiration of many uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients that make it uh, much easier to um, to market the generic versions of the of the pharmaceuticals. However, there might be a lot of a, a proliferation of uh, different companies that uh, provide a generic materials at a low cost, but it is important to characterize these materials a, a, because uh, a, we need to assess that uh, they are chemically pure, that they are chemically what they uh, tell us they are, and also uh, from the structural point of view, because uh, uh, the stability, the uh, processing conditions, the transport, the storage, and also the bioavailability bioavail of uh, these materials depend on the structure, uh, on the crystal structure of these uh, compounds. That's why we are interested in, the, uh, in studying the phenomenon of uh, polymorphism. It is also necessary to, to uh, know the quality of uh, different food ingredients like uh, uh, stabilizers, uh, dyes, different type of mineral supplements, etc., and make sure that they do not contain additives that uh, we know that have been banned in other uh, areas of the world because of uh, dangerous side effects. So uh, we have a, a very good uh, and large battery of um, chemical and structural characterization of uh, t a different techniques for chemical and structural characterization of materials, which include spectroscopic techniques, uh, such as uh, ultraviolet, visible uh, light spectroscopy, infrared, nuclear magnetic resonance, um, absorption uh, techniques, which are uh, very common in laboratories, uh, in academia, in, in the Latin American and the Caribbean region. There are other techniques also very, very popular and uh, well known and uh, very much uh, used uh, everywhere, uh, which are depend on the uh, thermal, um, on the on changes uh, in the material on the thermal conditions, uh, different uh, techniques uh, such as chromatography and different uh, uh, other methods. However, the, the diffraction techniques uh, uh, used uh, uh, where we use uh, powders or a small crystal fragment for uh, the analysis are the techniques that uh, give us the uh, most important information because they tell us what type of atoms we have in what position within the crystalline structure. And this is very important to understand how the material behaves uh, under processing, for example, how the compound interacts with a particular um, protein to have some kind of uh, therapeutic effect, etc. And uh, it's uh, good to point out that the FDA considers uh, X-ray powder diffraction as the technique that has to be used for the characterization of pharmaceutical solids. So these techniques are uh, very uh, important for the characterization of materials. So um, I have tried to uh, um, frame some uh, the few examples that I'm going to, to talk about uh, within uh, some of the goals uh, that, uh, that can be um, approached using uh, the, this type of, uh, of techniques or how we can 
uh, try to solve the problems that arise uh, in, in the production, for example, of pharmaceuticals or even in the uh, already the uh, finished product. So I'm going to just uh, show very briefly uh, the characterization of, um, of a product that has been sold extensively throughout Latin America. It is still found, even though there is uh, there are uh, several alerts by different uh, governments that uh, this is not uh, a, a natural product, it's not a homeopathic product, uh, etc. So we studied a, a product that is called Reumatrit uh, that comes a, in a, as a duo, uh, simplex and plus, and uh, you have to uh, take one tablet of each one uh, for the treatment or for the relief of uh, pain due to arthritis, gout, or other um, conditions uh, of the bones or, or the muscles. Uh, consumers have uh, uh, reported very, very immediate relief, but uh, they experience very uh, serious undesirable side effects. Uh, it is interesting that the composition of these products is very, it's very uh, 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 difficult to pinpoint actually because uh, uh, some um, some packages may indicate a, a particular composition uh, formed by plant or animal extracts, and other ones can say that it has something completely different. So, uh, but the the uh, the worst part is that these products do not have any kind of permissions for manufacturing uh, for manufacturing them. They usually have um, registry numbers that uh, do not exist uh, within the system of, uh, in particular, Venezuela and Colombia, which is uh, the, the products that we have examined, and they have uh, different types of irregularities. So this is why we, we think that uh, um, surveillance and uh, follow-up on this kind of products, uh, it's important uh, within uh, one of the goals uh, established as a responsible consumption and production of, uh, in particular, in this case, uh, pharmaceutical or uh, any kind of uh, a product that uh, is going to be used to, re to relieve uh, the symptoms of uh, a, a particular uh, illness. So we studied uh, both uh, presentation, both compounds, both products. And uh, we found that uh, they have, a, actually they are not natural, they have sodium diclofenac and they have prednisolone, which are, which is a common anti-inflammatory anti and an esteroid. Um, they are not natural, they are not bad, but they have to be uh, taken under a, a surveillance by the, by the medical, by the physician. So in both compounds, uh, they uh, declare that they are natural or homeopathic, but they are really not. So this is one of the things that we can tackle uh, with uh, X-ray diffraction. Another thing that uh, also uh, goes uh, and is related to climate change and uh, the possibility of losing some of our biodiversity is, for example, the study of secondary metabolites from plants um, that exist in the in the Andes, the Venezuelan, Colombian, and uh, in the all the Andes region that have been used for a long time uh, for different types of conditions. For we have studied in our laboratory, for example, anti-venoms uh, materials, uh, some uh, other materials that could be used as antibacterials, fungicides, antivirals, anti-tumor compounds. Uh, in particular. Uh, these uh, compounds come from uh, plants that grow above 3,000 meters uh, and that are very particular and very delicate. And, and everything that, uh, anything, I mean, even small uh, perturbation in the climate, uh, uh, in the rainfall and uh, in weather conditions could um, jeopardize the existence of, the, of these plants. I'm sorry. So, um, this, uh, this type of work, in this case, for example, we also prepare a new form of a bronchodilator uh, called clenbuterol, uh, which could be explored at some point as a possible uh, uh, different uh, type of uh, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, which could be easier to process or could 
could have in, in uh, theory could have some um, advantages over the forms that uh, we already know. And this goes, uh, or this will uh, also help um, in the in the case of uh, undergraduate or graduate students, for example, because this work has been uh, done uh, as part of the undergraduate and the PhD degree thesis of, uh, of uh, these two uh, colleagues now of us. Uh, so it, um, the, the work that can be done in this area uh, also uh, uh, is, a, is beneficial for the um, advancement in education and in uh, increasing and building capacity in the analysis of uh, different materials. Uh, we have uh, studied uh, different type of compounds and uh, also, uh, for example, the uh, different polymorphs of flunixin have been studied by also um, a PhD and undergraduate degree students, and that has been published in very uh, respected uh, journals uh, in the area. Uh, this, this is, uh, for example, trichloromethiacid, which is a diuretic that is uh, commonly used in all over Latin America and the Caribbean. And we also uh, collaborate with uh, different groups that uh, are trying to uh, prepare new materials based on, on the known materials that could have uh, a particular effect. For example, uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, compounds similar to rasahilin, which is uh, a compound uh, commonly used for the treatment of uh, Parkinson's disease. So um, all these projects, all, all this work uh, can uh, be beneficial not only to the population, uh, because we can help um, assess the quality of uh, the pharmaceutical ingredients that, uh, that we are using, but also help uh, achieving higher education uh, and expertise in particular uh, uh, techniques uh, of characterization of materials. Um, I, I would say that crystallography is very, very um, uh, useful in approaching uh, younger generations. And uh, since the, uh, the International Year of Crystallography in 2014, um, crystal growing competitions have been uh, uh, initiated in different parts of the world. And uh, for example, Argentina, uh, we will hear from uh, Dr. Diego Lamas later on at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, Argentinian time uh, about his experience uh, with these uh, very, very interesting activities that is very, uh, uh, is particularly appropriate for uh, encouraging uh, younger generations and uh, uh, of students that uh, could go into uh, work or uh, study uh, basic sciences. Okay, um, also crystallography is very active in uh, uh, courses uh, around Latin America and the Caribbean. And these are just uh, a few pictures of some uh, very large events that we have had uh, over the years. It's very important to know that uh, uh, our area of work or, and our organizations uh, in crystallography are particularly um, uh, interested in uh, assuring gender equality and uh, diversity uh, in all the activities. It's uh, within the, the framework and it's, and it's one of the requirements to receive um, support from the UCR to carry out uh, different types of, um, of activities. So, um, and uh, just to, to end also um, a very nice uh, uh, opportunity for a partnership with different uh, uh, organizations uh, resulted in the very successful LAMP program, which is uh, Light Sources for the Americas, Asia and the Middle East, uh, uh, Middle East and Pacific. Uh, that provides support for uh, a team of student of a student and uh, and a professor to spend a time at a synchrotron source to learn how to um, how to use the facilities and uh, solve particular problems that uh, 
that the team might have uh, as part of the thesis work of, uh, of, the, of the student. Um, so in, uh, at, at the end, I think uh, a crystallography is uh, very, uh, very prone to a partnership with uh, governments, for example, industries, academia, uh, equipment manufacturers, and software providers to set up a regional or national facilities that can uh, provide uh, services to assess the quality of uh, food uh, ingredients or pharmaceutical ingredients uh, so that the population can have, uh, can be sure uh, that it's uh, receiving a product of good quality and uh, at a cost that uh, can be afforded by these uh, populations. In this uh, regard, we would like to, yes? You're ready to finish. Yes, in this uh, regard, we would like to uh, uh, mention the possibility of the Caribbean hub for X-ray diffraction, the synchrotron, uh, uh, a new synchrotron source possibly in Mexico and the neutron source uh, in Argentina. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for the trouble with the presentation <laughs> and, uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank, thank you, and thank you all the panelists for their contributions. I'm sorry again that I came in late, <laughs> but I don't know if uh, Germán uh, wants to add anything to what you said, or, uh, or if we can uh, try to answer a few questions, or, or Juan Fernando, if you want to add something to what you said. Yes, Enrique, thank you. I would like to, to add some ideas that I collected during the weekend associated with scientific knowledge, associated with, with the sustainable development goals. For that, let me share my screen again. I won't take too long, but I, won't, I would like to show you this diagram, which is here, yeah. Of course, there's plenty of opportunities for developing very interesting scientific agenda uh, associated with the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, here we have the 17 goals and every one of these uh, goals uh, is a tremendous opportunity to develop not only, of course, uh, basic scientific research, but also important applied scientific research and engineering and technology. For instance, just th this is a very incomplete and of course very preliminary table associated or, or of, the, of the sciences that we need to involve to, to contribute to solve one of the, or the, the I said, uh, sustainable development goals. For instance, the, the goals of no poverty it requires knowledge about statistics, mathematics, economy, climatology, hydrology, ecology, and of course, transdisciplinary research. And in, in this regard, I, I would like to, to emphasize that, of course, the scientific research is not only necessary in terms of exact physical and natural sciences, but also social sciences, because many of these problems and issues are very much associated with societal, economical, and behavioral uh, uh, sciences. So we need to, to, to get together with the, the social scientists and, of, and also being in Latin America, I think that is very important to involve the ancestral and the traditional knowledge of our uh, ancestors in terms of indigenous pre-Columbian peoples because they have been living here for more than 10,000 years in peace with their environments and with their ecosystems. And they have a tremendous amount of knowledge associated with the functioning and with the behavior of, the, of our ecosystem. So I, I think that we need to, to get together to join forces between the natural scientists, the social scientists and the ancestral traditional wisdom and knowledge. And here I have some other examples for many of these sustainable development goals. 
of all the sciences, basic sciences that we need to bring to the fore to tackle these important issues. So there's plenty, plenty, plenty of opportunities to develop fascinating scientific research based on these problems with the, with the, the, a very large suite of, of scientific knowledge to solve these problems so to, and to tackle the, the, the challenges of the sustainable development goals. But, but the problem is how Latin America is uh, allocating resources and budgets to science and technology. As we can see in these two plots, uh, we, we can see that, for instance, the largest uh, budgets in scientific research and development in, in Latin America come from Brazil and Mexico and Argentina, perhaps. And these are the, the large, oh, sorry, and these are the largest in the, in the region. The other countries are way behind those three countries. But in terms of comparison with, with the rest of the world, Latin America is behind very well behind of the rest of the countries of the world, especially the global north. Uh, we can see in the two view graphs that's, that our uh, budgets in terms of in, 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 uh, in specific terms and in figures, but also as a portion of the GDP is very meager. So uh, if Latin America or Latin America has to understand that science is a prerequisite to leave poverty, to leave uh, underdevelopment, to leave uh, dependency, and, and to start creating a very powerful economies in terms of the, of the most important uh, asset that we have in, in Latin America, which is biodiversity. So what, that's the reason why we need to put many resources to, to develop the bio, the bio economy as a new paradigm of development in the continent, because this is our most important and comparative uh, resource uh, with respect to the other, other countries of the world, but without uh, funding properly science and development and technology, we are not going to reach those goals. So I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Herman. Uh, Juan Fernando. Yes, thank you. I, I would like to add something in the direction Herman was talking about, which is that I, I was trained as an engineer, and one notion I remember for from my training is that we could solve almost every problem with with a steel and concrete. And if the problem is very hard then we just need a more steel and more concrete and things like that. And the, the city where I live in Medellin in Colombia was talking about rivers, which is one of my main scientific interests. This city was built on the idea that we should build channels everywhere, trying to like to control the rivers. Uh, we now know that we, if we want to tackle uh, problems related to climate change and the, and the environmental crisis, we need to use a more complex approach. And this more complex approach needs to combine uh, scientific fields and needs basic science like, like biology, ecology, uh, hydrology, and things like that. We, don't, we cannot control nature. Uh, we, we, in many cases, we have to understand nature and we have to find ways to adapt to this changing world uh, using a combination of, of solutions that are not only based on engineering, like, as, like I was trained, but also based on, on nature, of course, and on people too. This is something I knew from, from the people, from some people here in my city, they used to talk about uh, solutions based on people, not only on nature. And, and this requires combining all types of science. So, so if we 
if we are going to solve these problems and if we are going to adapt to climate change, we have to change also our way of conceiving our solutions in many cases. We have to challenge ourselves in many cases. I have to challenge my training uh, all days. Now uh, I'm more like a scientist, not an engineer, but or I would like to be, but okay, thanks. Thank you. Graciela, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, what uh, what uh, Juan just mentioned is uh, is true. We have to think. Uh, uh, we have to change our way of uh, approaching the solution of the problem. Uh, but also, our funding offices need to um, uh, somehow respect <laughs> a little bit. Uh, the need for uh, basic science. Uh, many, many uh, governments are, um, uh, for example, requiring that uh, your research necessarily has to solve a problem. We can try to solve, we can think about possibly solving a, a problem, but uh, we need, uh, we need to, to start with uh, basic science. We need uh, people trained in basic sciences, uh, biology, mathematics, physics, and chemistry, and, um, and uh, strengthen our uh, undergraduate degree programs, which I think in general, very good. And uh, I keep uh, strengthening our uh, graduate degree programs that uh, recently I think probably are, are, are not uh, getting the resources that, that we need. So um, yeah, as uh, as uh, Juan mentioned, we we have to think, uh, we have to change a little bit the the way that uh, we approach uh, the the solution. I, I think I think that's a very important point to to change our ways of doing things. Someone said that the the world is going is going to be there for for a long time. What we're trying. To what we're trying to do really as human beings is to destroy ourselves. The, the world is not going to be destroyed unless there is a, a terrible disaster. But as far as we can tell, the, 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 the earth is going to continue. Uh, the ones that are not going to continue is, is us as human beings. And, and we have to change and we have to insist on that. First and, for, uh, and foremost, with the governments. As, as all of you have mentioned, unless there, there are enough resources to do science, it's very difficult to, to progress and, and come close to the other countries, uh, especially as you say in the global north. Although I, I like to, to mention the fact that in the meeting, in meeting that I was recently, the expression global north and global south expressions were, were being challenged. Why? What is what is the global south? How do you define it? Uh, in my opinion, it's just a way of not calling us underdeveloped. Uh, someone invented global north, global south. Um, yes, German, you, you have your hand. Uh, thank you, Rick. No, I just wanted to add something uh, about what uh, Juan Fernando and Graciela referred to, which is the need. Of course, the, the, the need for uh, appropriate budgets is very important in Latin America, but also the need, the need for a proper perspective on what to fund. For instance, in Colombia in the last decade or so, there, there was some fashion to fund projects associated with the development of patents. Of course, this is very important, but the government didn't understand that for you or for us to have patents, you have to cover all the bases from the basic science, biology, nanotechnology, mm -hmm. physics, chemistry, uh, all the sciences, even mathematics, of course. Mathematics is very important, and statistics. So the government has to understand that in order to have patents, we need to cover all the bases, all the way from basic science to applied science, to technology, to engineering, and to the development of patents. So the need is not only for uh, good proper funding, but also uh, good and proper and adequate politics or policies, I'm sorry, policies 
uh, about the funding of research because as Graciela was saying, of course, we need to develop basic science. Basic science is the most important, is, is fundamental for, the for this change linking uh, scientific research with the production of patents. This is really what the International Year of Basic Science for Sustainable Development is trying to do. It's trying to emphasize on governments and people in general that basic sciences are important for sustainable development. And you have mentioned it, you, all of you have mentioned uh, different aspects in which basic sciences are important, are necessary, and, and, and we need to continue fighting for, for, for a different way of approaching science in, in our countries. This business of uh, basic versus applied uh, doesn't, doesn't work. It's, that's not the way, as Graciela said, you know, uh, many, many, in many instances, or in most in instances, at least in Colombia, funding comes only if you say in your proposal that you're going to discover something, that you're going to solve some problem, and that's not the way science work. this works. It, it takes time, it takes a lot of thinking, a lot of uh, experimentation. It's not like from one day to the next, you're going to have a result and a product. So that's, that's particularly important. I want to ask you something. I know that Graciela has a, a strong involvement in this, but I don't know about the other two. With the Caribbean, uh, how, how much do you work with the, the islands of the Caribbean? And, and uh, is, there, is there any sense that uh, things are being done there or we still need to, to get closer to those islands? I know Graciela has uh, important e efforts uh, going on in Jamaica, for example. And I, I have to say that uh, the, uh, the liaison committee of the vocal point was, in, uh, we were in, in the Dominican Republic uh, a few months, a few weeks ago, and we were impressed by the, by the science that is being done in the Dominican Republic. So maybe this is, mm -hmm. a, this is something that we have to look into and see how we can how we can collaborate with them and, and work more broadly with with them. I, again, we realize that languages are always seem to be a, a, a barrier, but most people in most regions speak English. So we just have to. I just want to know what your your opinions are, particular Herman and, and Juan Fernando, um, because as I say, I know that Graciela is involved. Yeah, Graciela is involved everywhere. Saw, <laughs> not too long ago, she was South Africa. Crystallography <laughs> so, is really important. World. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, Enrique, this is a very important issue because, you know, in, in my in my field in climate change, for instance. Uh, there is there was a fundamental problem with the with the Caribbean is that they belong to another chapter of the IPCC reports. They don't belong to Central and South America. Mm. They belong to the small island chapter. So they they are like a completely different continent in, in, with respect to Latin America, which I I think is a mistake, because I mean we're very close neighbors. We shared many, many of the same problems and many of the same consequences associated with climate change. But I think it's a mistake because that way we are not speaking to each other and the, and the gap between the science and the solution is going to increase with, with, with the years. So I think we need to break that barrier and we can, uh, we need to struggle to be part of the same continent because we are part of the same continent. It, yeah. But but as you said, the language barrier nowadays is not uh, an excuse for for trying to reach this uh, uh, to to bridge this gap between Latin America and the Caribbean, because as you said, I I know very very uh, important signs being developed in in, in many of the island of, of the Caribbean. So we need to we need to overcome this limitation. Thank you, Juan. 
Yes, I, I just have to say that I would like to, but I haven't collaborated with, with colleagues from the islands in the Caribbean. And now that you ask that, I don't really know why, because they are so close. <laughs> they are, yeah, maybe it's part also of the things I have to change in my mind. I, I most of the time look to to other, yeah, to Brazil, to Venezuela, to Ecuador, Argentina. I don't know. Maybe it's part also of my setup. Right. Oh, definitely, definitely. We, as you as you can see, I have a, a bad cold, but uh, definitely we need to work more south to south. You know, relations between between ourselves and in other countries in the in the southern part of the world. Um, we all tend to have our collaborations with the U.S. or England or. But anyway, it's, it's, it's important, and I am glad I asked the question because uh, I'm even more glad that, that you agree with me. We yes. need to <laughs> Graciela, you want to add something? Yeah, no, no, I agree. And uh, we usually refer to Latin America uh, as only the countries in the in the continent. We usually do not include the islands, and and we have to look at the Caribbean as a as a whole region. Yes, I, I, I agree. One, one last question, uh, which is a little uh, uh, problematic to answer is, do you really think, each one of you, we still have a few minutes, um, that the sustainable development goals are going to be fulfilled by 2030? How do you see that in your own regions or countries? Well, Enrique, I would say that uh, I am a, I am very pessimistic in that regard. And some somebody said that a pessimistic a pessimist is an op, a well informed optimism optimism. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't think because especially because of the pandemics, COVID nineteen uh, delayed all the economic progress worldwide. And may and especially in our countries, in and 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 this has impacted all the all the issues associated with the sustainable development goals. So we need uh, perhaps the UN system should convene to uh, redesign or to rethink the timeline for the um, reaching of the goals a realistic one that considers all the problems that the pandemic caused all over the world, not only in terms of economic uh, burden, but also in all the problems that it caused to the uh, supply chain of many services and goods all over the world. Uh, and so therefore the United Nations system has to be honest, I would say in a, Good sense to redefine the timeline for the reaching of the sustainable development goals, uh, not only because of the, the lack of progress in many of those uh, challenges in, in the global south, <laughs> in the developing world, but also for the, the challenges and the impacts uh, brought about uh, from the pandemics. Thank you, um, Graciela. Yeah, I I also think it would be difficult to completely fulfill uh, the goals, but uh, and uh, perhaps uh, I'm sure some countries will uh, approach a, a closer to the to the goal uh, than others, and that's something that we have to to try to. Uh, correct uh, and help uh, 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 all countries to to try to go in this pretty much in the same direction, and also um, to uh, to have a, a, a consistent development throughout the years. And uh, because uh, it, it's going to be difficult, but uh, with uh, with the help of uh, the uh, countries uh, such as Brazil, Argentina, Mexico that have uh, longer traditions, Chile, uh, and more uh, established uh, 
societies uh, for uh, to, that can uh, be involved in in all these uh, issues uh, help uh, uh, other countries to to uh, progress and and try to reach uh, the goals that we want to reach. Thank you, Juan Fernando. Very quickly, I have to ask yeah. the organizers yeah. how this ends. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to to be optimistic despite the, the the difficulties in the problem. And one thing I just want to say is that I'm hoping for kind of a tipping point. We are used to think that tipping points are bad, but not necessarily. Maybe we need kind of a tipping point, uh, not in nature but in the society. And and I think this tipping point, the society is is likely. And if it happens, maybe we we can make the changes in the society we need to to tackle these problems because we have the solutions, we have the understanding, we have the science. The, we are not solving the problem not because we don't have the solutions, but because we cannot change human beings' minds, things changes in the way of thinking. So we need a tipping point in social things, and we I have hope in new generations. So. Just trying to be optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> as, a member, as a member of the Young Academy, yeah, not what you just said. Despite uh, I'm not so young. <laughs> Enrique, let me finish to say something that I think is important at this point. We as scientists have, we need to defend our profession. In this time, uh, we are facing very, very threatening, very mm, worrisome threats from the anti-science movement, from the uh, dispersers of fake news, from the uh, uh, Tierra Planistas, how do you say that? <laughs> Earth, Flat Earth Earth Earth. Earth. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Trumps from the Bolsonaro's from, from the like. So we as scientists <laughs> in the developing world, especially, we need to defend our profession and we need to defend science as the basis of all our progress. So in this area of this uh, uh, amazing uh, denial of science, the denialism of science, we need to defend our profession. Thank you. I have to ask the, the organizers, how do, how do we end this? Did you just cut us off or? or, or? <laughs> All right, you still, in theory, you, you still have 10 minutes if you would like to continue discussion with one additional question or any closing remarks. That's wonderful. Thank you, because <laughs> I, think, I think there are more things that we want to say. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm, I'm sorry that we run this last few minutes and then thinking that it was going to stop at, at uh, 35, but uh, if we have 10, minutes, 10 more minutes, then then we are open to, to more to more conversation about all these issues. Um, I would like to expand my my answer. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, because I, I was saying that I, I try to be optimistic. It's it's very hard, but but one reason another reason to be optimistic is that now the new generations climate change is not new for for something new something that appear for the new generations the most important people making decisions nowadays uh, knew about climate change during their life uh, of course there are many people that uh, want to change to make uh, important changes but but new generations that will be in charge in let's say like 10 years uh, or so grow with climate change and know I, I think they know better than former generations that their future is really compromised i just read a paper recently published by the group of tim lenton from the university of exeter just saying that a big part of colombia will become uninhabitable if we reach 1.5 Celsius degrees in climate change and it's very likely that we will reach that limit in the next decade 
So we are talking about big parts of Colombia becoming uninhabitable in like 10 years. So it's very hard to, to be optimistic <laughs> facing this, this, this scenario, but, but, but we, we have, we have solutions and, and, and I think people is changing and people can change and people will eventually change for one or another reason. That, that's what I think. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to mention you can be optimistic, but you can also be realistic at the same time. So I'm optimistic. I, I know we can uh, achieve many things, but uh, uh, well, the reality tells us that it's not uh, going to be at the same pace as uh, as the as the global north, uh, unfortunately. But uh, we we will certainly make uh, our best effort, and we have to make our best effort to to um uh, to make uh, to to make uh, the changes that we need to make so that uh, we will be uh, in the in the spotlight because uh, as you have mentioned we have uh, uh, many resources we have um, expertise we have uh, a long tradition uh, in different areas in in basic sciences and in advanced sciences so uh, we we can do it so i'm up cautiously uh, optimistic you can say somebody suggested that maybe the word goals should be changed for by objectives uh, you may or may not reach an objective but goal is kind of, that's it uh, yeah there. <laughs> so that, that, but that but that's the name you'll that's be interested to know, of course that the uh, the group that has organized the international year is now working on a decade decade of uh, basic science for sustainable development and, and mm -hmm. it's going to be presented to UNESCO as an idea mm -hmm. to have 10 years of, uh, of this general idea that is being developed right. through this international year. So and that they're working very hard on getting that approved by UNESCO. So that's that's good news in that respect that that, that we continue to but the problem, one of the problems here is that we have many, uh, as they say now, stakeholders involved. One is governments. Mm -hmm. If governments don't don't interiorize, don't don't accept the fact that this is important, then that's that's the first problem. The second problem is the scientific community, and I I was going to ask you if we had time. I'd like to ask you, but let me just give you that this other. Uh, so government, scientific community, funders, and the social society, the, the civil society. And unless, unless the government and, and all these other organizations try to really sell the idea of the sustainable development goals to, to the, to the uh, society, what the change that Juan Fernando is talking about is going to be very difficult to achieve. Because people don't want to change the ways of doing things. We're very happy taking the car and driving to the to the drugstore next door, you know. And 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 this is something that needs to change. And hopefully, as you say, maybe maybe that will happen. Maybe we will get to that point. But you know, and, and be optimistic, as you all said uh, about this. And so. Um, Yes, Herman, you wanted to add something or? No, Enrique, I, thank you very much. Well, I, I I would just say that there are a few things that I picked up as, as you were speaking um, that I'd like to refer to them. Uh, one is the, uh, the importance of, of bringing together social sciences and, and natural sciences. That's, that's the reason for being of the International Science Council. As you probably know, the, the ISC was created by precisely uniting the International Union for uh, Scientific Unions, the International Council of Scientific Unions, yes. and the International Council of so so Social Sciences, ESSI, ISSI, ISSC. Bring them into one organization, which is the International Science Council. That's, that's an important step forward. It, it started in 2018, but it has to become like, like part of our vocabulary all the time. Let's right. put together these two things 
And in addition to that, what Germán said uh, is, uh, is making sure that traditional knowledge is included. In my opinion, we have included it historically, but maybe it is not as noticeable. We all know, those of us have, who have done field work, know that there's a lot of information that we receive from people even without asking. They are there to give us information, what they use things for, and so that that has to be increased without going to the extremes that that's the only thing that is important. And that because the traditional knowledge exists and the, the, uh, the science that we do is not necessary. And, and that's, that's very dangerous and it's something that we have to be very careful about and, okay. and, and be really in the lookout for that kind of attitude. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is what you mentioned, uh, Graciela, of, 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 the, of the natural products. That's mm -hmm. terrifying, you know, to, to know that there are so many things being sold to people telling them that they're something that they are not. And so the kind of research that you're doing and, and the way you put it together with the development goals, it was very clear and very obvious that, that that's what needs to be done. We, we need to be very careful about what, what the pharmaceuticals we use and, and, and whether they have been carefully studied and whether mm -hmm. we know exactly what they're telling telling us exactly. that they do uh, what they are what their compounds are because it exactly. is uh, I, I remember a professor of the national university here in bogota doing that at a, a, a local market going asking people what they were selling those plants for and then having them studied at the chemistry laboratory at the national university and, and some some things came out that were not particularly nice uh, <laughs> the, the need the need for resources we all know that God, I, I, I wish we could sell that idea to the governments. You know, what, what Herman said of us having the lowest uh, percentage of uh, gross, uh, the G GDP in, in the whole world. We, we, can't, we can't get anywhere when most countries in Latin America are below 0 0.5, most. Argentina is at 0 0.5. Cuba says that they are at 0 0.6. I have to believe them, but uh, Brazil is 1.1. And the rest of us are way behind. There are countries in Latin America with 0.03% of, of uh, GDP in science and technology. So that's, that's really... That's really bad news. And, and the science we do is so good uh, with such limited resources that the rest of the world has to understand that and has to start working with us. Uh, one of the, the, of the ideas that I, I am defending at the international uh, or union uh, me meetings is stop talking about um, capacity building only. When, when you are in an international organization, you tend to think of these countries as countries that need to be taught what to do. And they have to come here and tell us and, and, and teach us things. And I keep telling them, there are many things just like, like the indigenous knowledge. There is so much that we can teach them because we're in a country like Colombia where we have everything that most people don't have. So they have to start working with us, recognizing our capacities recognizing what we have. I'm not saying that fellowships are not good. They are always good. No, no matter who gives them, they're good. But we have to start, and I, I said that last week, I said we have to start including the word network, networking, mm -hmm. not just capacity building, because that has, that has a, a meaning that I, I basically don't like. Herman. Yeah, last idea is that we need to bring another stakeholder into the fore, which is the private sector and the businesses. All over the world, the expenditure of the private sector in scientific research, basic scientific research is very huge. And in, in many countries, the, the portion of, of uh, investment in science and technology by the private sector is even larger than the government. So here we need to, to bring in uh, this other stakeholder the private sector and the businesses to fund scientific research, even basic scientific research. Research, research has been done as 
in, 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 in regards to how much does the government have to invest before the private sector begins to, to put money into this. And it has come to about 0.8% of the, of the GDP. When the country starts spending 0.8, and that has happened in Finland and happened in New Zealand, so it's, it's a, a good point to keep in mind for this kind of thing. But we have to start talking to them. And, and some of them already do a few things, but yeah, that's important. Uh, transdisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity is another thing that we need to start working. Unless the chemists and the physicists and the biologists and the mathematicians start talking to each other, we're going to be stuck not being able to do a lot of things. So those, those two, two terms are very important and, and, and the future of, of our world depends on, on mm -hmm. how we work together and you all put that very clearly in your presentations. The change of approach, let's finish with that. You know, we need to change our approach to life. We need to change our approach to how we use our resources, uh, understand, accept, and believe in the fact that in the case of Colombia, but most tropical countries in, in the Americas, we're very rich in what we can offer. Uh, when we're rich in what we can uh, take advantage of, we can use really to the advantage of our countries and to the, to the economy of our countries and stop thinking about just one or two ways of getting, getting. but again, Trans ener energetic transition or transition of energy doesn't happen from one day to the next, <laughs> just like every anything, every, everything else. Things don't happen from one day to the next. It's going to take time and we have to understand that. We have to think that we have to move. We have to understand that we have to move in that direction, but we cannot do it in three years, believe me. You cannot <laughs> leave oil and, and, and uh, coal uh, a lot of the question in three years, that, that doesn't work. But anyway, um, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you to the uh, International Year for giving us this opportunity. I again apologize for being late. It was, it was the fault of the link, not my fault. I was sitting here since 3.30 waiting to start. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all, all the panelists and, and thank you um, the organizers for this opportunity.